It's a great pleasure to start off this evening to um, lay the foundations, I think, for the next couple of talks. And I'm going to be talking to you about the value of molecular tests to diagnose and detect uh, ciprofloxacin susceptible uh, gonorrhea in clinical practice. Now, I think this is a particularly useful um, bar chart to show you. What it's uh, trying to tell you is that um, it's looking at the available resistance-free antimicrobial classes for Neisseria gonorrhea in each decade. And what you can see is that we've basically gone from zero to zero in a hundred years, which basically means before antibiotics there was no, obviously no antibiotics to use. And now uh, in the, after 2010, there wasn't one class of antibiotics available that hadn't had resistance uh, detected and reported. And in fact, our heyday was really in the 1980s. Those of you who remember the 1980s, we had three, three classes we could use. That was when it was easy, but now uh, I'm afraid we're down to zero. Um, and uh, the future is, is going to be a challenge for us, I think, because if you, if you look at the pipeline, it's quite uh, empty. Um, there's a few drugs coming up to phase three, a couple of drugs, but really we have very little behind that. And uh, the pipeline for the introduction of new drugs basically takes about 15 years and about $800 million US dollars from target uh, to product. Uh, and to put that into, into what it means in real life practice, for, you need to screen between 5,000 and 10,000 products to get five drugs that will make it uh, to the clinical trials and for every one drug that will eventually get FDA approval and of course FDA approval or CE approval in the case of Europe is critical if you're going to bring in a, a new drug in, in to treat patients. It's been very clear over the last few decades that we're seeing a declining uh, number of antibacterial approvals. So where you're seeing lots of other drugs coming forward for statins to keep you living longer uh, and blood pressure medicines and stuff like that, for antibiotics uh, it's really been a downward trend and that's been going on since the uh, mid middle of the 1980s. And uh, the reasons for this are, are several. There are increasing costs for development of antibiotics and there are extensive licensing and regulation uh, processes involved and they've become more complicated with time. Genomics has also uh, delivered very few new my antimicrobial targets and we hoped when genomics came in that we would get a lot of new targets to help us get new antibiotics but few targets were found and when they were found they were predominantly for gram positive bacteria and not for the gram negatives like for example Neisseria gonorrhea. Uh, the other thing that's been happening, and you'll be well aware of this, is many of the major diagnostic uh, and pharma companies have been merging. And so when the pharma companies merge, there's a lot of cost saving that goes on, and quite often what happens is the scientists um, end up being laid off or asked to retire and, and so forth, and uh, you end up with a smaller number of scientists within the, the company. And that slows down the amount of research that can be done. Um, and so there's a substantial reduction in research capacity. And as a result, many uh, of the companies, of the pharma companies, have withdrawn from antimicrobial development and rather placing their efforts on anti-cancer drugs, as I said, or some things to deal with your lipids or your blood pressure, where there's a much greater market as we all live older. And on top of that, there's, there's been reduced an academic funding. And so there's been more pressure and more reliance on acad academia and universities to do some of this research work. But as the global economy has been struggling in the last few decades, interest in, in, in people's shares uh, and companies' uh, charitable trusts and so forth, uh, they produce less money. There's less money to give out for grants uh, and then basically less research. Um, and so. That's been a challenge for many academics in the field. And then you add on to that what we know very well is that STIs are stigmatized. And it's not only for patients that the stigma is an issue, it's also for the researchers trying to get funding and competing against areas like tuber tuberculosis or against, for example, cancer. Um, so STIs often are placed as a low um, research uh, priority. So we really need to start thinking about antimicrobial resistance containment and this was put together by John Tapsell quite a long time ago but I think it really does give us the 
a number of the issues that we need to think about. So on one hand, you've got the antimicrobial drugs, and on the other hand, you've got the human or animal infections. If you think about the drugs, you've got regulatory um, frameworks, drug procurement, drug quality, and management of the drug supply uh, that need to be um, considered. Um, and there are various ways of doing that, and you can see those um, highlighted on this slide. Um, and then for the infections themselves, we've got to think about the disease burden. So therefore, we want good disease control and prevention. That's what we try and do in our clinics every day. We need quality diagnostic testing for the diagnostics, and we've got to think about prescribers' behavior. Uh, and that means we need appropriate treatment regimens. And then the consumer's expectations are also critically important. And that involves a lot of consumer health education. And so tonight, what we're going to be focusing on with the, as we get into the, the next couple of speakers is, is thinking about appropriate treatment regimens that we could use and making sure we've got quality diagnostic tests which give us accurate results. And if we can do all of this, we do have the opportunity, I would suggest, to try and at least contain antimicrobial resistance for now, buying us time until new drugs come around, or should we ever be lucky enough to see a gonococcal vaccine appear, that would probably be the only hope to uh, really getting on top of the, the gonorrhea epidemic. So there are a number of strategic approaches to maintain efficacious treatment of gonorrhea um, that have been put forward. And the first one is the one that's done in many countries, including Australia, uh, and I'm assuming also New Zealand. Um, but many countries in Europe follow the same as, as, as does North America. And that's to use a cephalosporin, i.e. keftriaxone, along with another effective antimicrobial agent in combination as a multi-drug um, therapy regimen. Another alternative, and that's been favoured particularly in Japan and, so, and also China, is to administer cephalosporins on their own, but at higher doses. Some have even suggested you could use intramuscular keftriaxone and then perhaps follow on for a short period of time with uh, oral um, cephalosporins. It's been suggested you might want to consider fire breaks. Um, these are the, the options of using rotating different antibiotics. So for example, a few months you'll use antibiotic A, then you can switch to antibiotic B. To do this, you need a lot of antibiotics that the, the drugs, that the organism is susceptible to, and we're in a position now where we've really pretty much lost, um, lost most of the antibiotics without the ability to do diagnostic uh, susceptibility testing. Um, these firebreak approaches have been used with some success in the I I ICU, but really haven't been uh, put forward yet as, as a, in practice uh, to deal with uh, STIs. And then I think what we're really going to talk about tonight is antimicrobial susceptibility guided therapy. Um, this enables patient individualized treatment on the basis of susceptibility uh, profiles. Now, I'm old enough to know this is not a new approach. And uh, I think it's, it's, it makes me laugh sometimes when I hear people talking about this sort of approach now, like uh, you know, it never happened before. When I was a young uh, doctor in uh, sexual health, um, I used to wait for a week after I saw a patient with what looked like gonorrhea to get my result to say the culture had grown gonorrhea and it was sensitive to penicillin or sensitive to, in those days or sensitive to ciprofloxacin. Then you would treat the patient based on the sensitivity that you received with the diagnosis all at the same time. Um, and. Uh, you could adjust or your treatment if, for example, the patient had a PPNG, a penicillinase producing gonococcus, you might then give them a second line treatment as, the, as their first line option. But the problem was this took about five to seven days and that was in a centre in London. That li the clinic was right next to the laboratory and of course if you're living in a more rural area away from the laboratory, it can take another, at least another week and ev even longer to get those results. And so it becomes very difficult to manage the patient. Now, importantly, we've seen a decline in gonococcal culture uh, capacity um, since the introduction of NATS to diagnose gonorrhea in the early 1990s. What happened was, uh, as well, in the late 1990s, um, WHO um, pushed very hard for many resource poor countries to abandon laboratory testing completely. Um, and so syndromic management was introduced where patients are diagnosed and treated with syndromic algorithms 
with, with drugs in, in set packages um, on the day that they present. So you had resource poor countries not sending laboratory tests anymore and you had the rich countries uh, of the world using the molecular tests now to diagnose gonorrhea but no longer sending the cultures and so the result of that was a couple or well, four main things I think that, that we need to consider first. The loss of the laboratory capacity and this is a difficult organism to work with. You do need to be doing it every day to grow this organism. Um, and the loss of um, technology, technologist competences. And a lot of retraining having to go on in many places. Oh, I worked in Africa, for example, um, to trying to get surveillance up and running. Many of the labs couldn't do the gonococcal culture to begin with, and then we had to teach everybody how to grow the organism and do the subcultures and testing. The other thing was you got a reduction in the availability of the culture-based AMR data because it wasn't there anymore in the countries that were doing it previously. They now had molecular results, just saying gonorrhea positive, but no um, data on sensitivities. Um, and then that also was a problem with the, the laboratory, um, the lack of laboratory expertise in terms of AMR surveillance, antimicrobial resistance surveillance in many countries. And so we started to get less and less information about what was happening in the world. We were very happy with our molecular assays. The patients got, came in very quickly, they got treated, but we really weren't on top of what was happening with the resistance. Um, and so AMR didn't get contained, unfortunately, at the global level, perhaps as quickly as it could have been. And this is a very nice uh, graph. It's from a paper from Nicola Lowe and colleagues. And they're looking at the data here from the, the England and Wales from the Gentle Urinary Medicine Clinics. And they're looking at trends in the gonorrhea cases, which are, is in the red, the red line. Um, and they're going to be looking at the NAT testing and the AMR prevalence. The NAT testing relates to the two bars. Um, you can see towards the uh, right side of the um, x-axis. And then in green, you've got resistance to ciprofloxacin and in blue you've got resistance or decrease, decreased susceptibility to cofixin. So you can see if you follow the red line along that uh, NATS were introduced and, and for gon Neisseria gonorrhea and licensed around 1991. Then there was a, a, a gradual increase uh, in the number of diagnoses, number of cases were diagnosed because it was a more sensitive test we were screening more people, it was easier to have a test that could use urine, became more acceptable, we saw more cases. But then you saw ciprofloxacin resistance starts to emerge, that's the green line, and there was a switch to extended spectrum cephalosporins. With, in the case of the UK, they went to the oral um, form cofixi, and that was given with azithromycin. But gradually the um, cofixi susceptibility or decreased susceptibility started to emerge as a problem towards 2008-2009 uh, and there was a switch around 2011 to, from cofixine to keftraxone to be given with the azithromycin and you can see after that the cofixine um, decreased susceptibility became less of a problem and interestingly there was a, at that point a decrease in the ciprofloxacin resistance which was sitting at around over 30 percent but it's, it still maintained itself um, above 20 percent today. Now the bars show you the proportion of um, gonorrhea that was diagnosed by NAT rather than culture. So you can see that that increase from 2009 to 2012 were over 50% over, um, of the gonorrhea cases were diagnosed on NATS um, without the, uh, not by culture. So we rely more and more on NATS. So we are approaching a crisis point and I think it's a time now for us to think about a new approach and to implement one because azithromycin is increasing and you've got a graph here showing what's been happening in South Australia and this data was from a couple of years ago but I mean they continue to see um, high levels over 20 percent resistance now uh, in, in South Australia and some of the other uh, jurisdictions and territories in, um, in Australia are also affected um, and at lower levels of resistance in, in some, some of the places. So that's a problem and in the UK um, also they've had outbreaks of high level drug resistance uh, to azithromycin. There's also been the emergence this year of the extensively drug resistant gonorrhea. So these are strains where we had MICs to keftriaxone of 0.5 milligrams a litre. This is deemed as resistant and likely to, to fail and certainly failed in the throat in the patients, two of the patients that were followed up.
Um, and also highly resistant to azithromycin with extremely high MICs due to the, um, the mutations in the 23S ribosomal RNA genes. So those strains now threaten the, the current regimens that we have. We have a lack of alternative agents to use with keftriaxone because of the azithromycin issue. So the, the question becomes, can we limit the use of keftriaxone through the use of older drugs? So this brings up the whole issue of antimicrobial stewardship, a new way of thinking. And I think for, for a lot of doctors working in uh, sexual health clinics, we, we can be a bit isolated from the rest of the hospital where this has become a big issue for many, many years. But we often sort of reach for that prescription pad and just write that antibiotic for whether it's a thick urethral discharge or just a tingle in, in, in the urethra. So, you know, I'm very keen now that we we careful about those tingles that uh, we, we uh, actually um, take samples and work out what we're trying to treat before we start um, just throwing out antibiotics. So this is a new way of thinking. We never used to think like this. So ciprofloxacin susceptibility guided therapy um, is something that's very safe to do if you've got a result which says it's ciprosensitive, um, and despite the local resistance trend. So for example, in urban Australia, ciprofloxacin resistance may be in the region of 25 to 30 percent, which means that you know six, between 70 to 75 percent of strains will be sensitive. The resistance levels are too high to use empiric therapy, but if you knew you could use it because it was susceptible, the strain you were dealing with, there's no reason why you shouldn't use it. And this removes the um, evolutionary selective pressure that we love to put on in sexual health clinics, the one drug for all. Start with the lowest dose, generate resistance, up the dose and generate more resistance. So we can get away with the one drug for all and start to treat more rationally. And it also spares unnecessary use of keftriaxone and simplifies treatment. So there are a lot of pros why you would want to go this way. Number one, ciprofloxacin is an extremely effective drug for oropharyngeal gonorrhea. And we're very concerned about the development of resistance to cephalosporins and other antibiotics uh, and we believe a lot of this is occurring in the throat where it's mixing, Neisseria gonorrhea is mixing with the other commensals which may be already resistant and DNA is passing between commensal Neisseria and, uh, and the gonococcus. Which means it's basically an ideal drug to treat gonorrhea in men who have sex with men and this particular group of our patients are probably the biggest concern for the emergence of antibiotic resistance in large numbers. Admitting that the recent cases of XDR Gonorrhea were in heterosexuals, um, so we have to consider this problem for everybody. But certainly, if you look at where the gonorrhea is occurring, a majority of it is in the MSM populations in our big cities. It's a single oral dose, not an intramuscular dose like um, um, keftraxone, and it has minimal side effects. So we think it'll be likely to be very popular with the patients compared to keftraxone. Of course, it's quite a painful injection for the patients to have to put up with, particularly if they're getting repeated infections. And I think importantly in this day of trying to improve efficiency in the way we, we work in clinics, it'll reduce the number of patients going to the treatment room for injections, which will be a great uh, delight to the nurses uh, working uh, day in, day out, injecting people these days. But we do have to um, remember as well that ciprofloxacin has some issues for pregnancy. So in Australia, it's listed as a category B3 drug which means there's limited data of using it in the context of pregnancy, but no evidence so far that it's caused any problems in pregnancy within humans. But there are studies in animals which basically show evidence of an increased occurrence of fetal damage, um, and the significance of that is still somewhat uncertain in humans. There are some caveats which I think is important. First of all, I'd say it's not an option, th uh, this approach, for countries using syndromic management because they don't have the laboratories to run the tests. That makes sense. And it's also going to be to have an unlikely impact in countries with a high prevalence of ciprofloxacin resistant gonorrhea already. So this shows some data from the Western Pacific region, WHO, and you can see that many of the countries listed here already have resistance to ciprofloxacin over 70%. So introducing an assay that's going to be able to detect ciprofloxacin susceptibility is probably going to have limited impact in terms of public health. And countries listed there include countries, well-resourced countries like uh, Japan, it includes China, and you can see also some of the other countries like the Philippines. But countries like New Zealand or Australia, 
you'll see lower levels of um, resistance and therefore the test like this might offer more potential at this point in time. The other thing to consider is that I think that while testing remains in the laboratory, which you likely do with the, with the rollout of a test that could test for ciprofloxacin susceptibility at this point in time, um, it's not an ethical thing to wait for the result before treating, I think, a patient with a florid urethral discharge or a woman with pelvic inflammatory disease because you'd be very worried about the onset of, of complications while you're waiting for those results and it could enable onward transmission. But should it be possible with technology to be able to bring this test into the clinic, either in the form of a rapid test, a point of care test, or to, or to have clinics like, for example, you've seen in Dean Street, where you can have the molecular assays run on machines in the services, then you know that would be quite feasible in these patients to get the result within, in a short period of time and then treat them accordingly with ciprofloxacin if they were susceptible. So that brings me to the end of what I had to say, which is really to set the scene. And I think we are at the start of a new era. And I think that uh, Speedex have worked very hard to try and make uh, ciprofloxacin susceptibility guided therapy a reality. And I think it is really going to make a difference to the way we, we work. We've seen this happen with the M genitalium assay. I think it'll be equally successful um, for those countries that can use ciprofloxacin still uh, as an adjunct to uh, save um, excessive use of keftriaxone and to prevent ongoing resistance to that particular antibiotic through uh, antibiotic stewardship and drug sparing. So thank you for your attention. I'll pass on to uh, David Wiley shortly.